Welcome to Sheldon Museum of Art. I'm Erin Hannes, Curator of Academic Engagement here, and I'm really pleased to welcome you all to this evening's collection talk, featuring artist Cristina Fernandez in conversation with Professor Lara Munoz. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to thank the supporters who made this program possible. The Hickson Lead Endowment, the Institute for Ethnic Studies, Assurity Life Foundation, and Sheldon Art Association. Thank you also to our members and to all of you in the audience this evening. Thank you for joining us. So last year, Sheldon was fortunate to acquire two photographs from Cristina Fernandez's Lavanderia series. One is currently on view in the exhibition A Decade of Collecting Works on Paper. The other is part of the 2023 to 2024 Sheldon Statewide Exhibition, A Day's Work, which is currently in North Platte. And so it's really truly an honor to have the artist with us here today and be able to learn from her about her work through the conversation she's about to have with Professor Munoz. Um, I will say that we will end with audience Q&A. So as questions come up, please hold those and um, we'll ask you to raise your hand. We're recording this evening's event, so we'll want you to speak into the microphone. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers. Christina Fernandez is a Los Angeles-based artist who has spent over three decades conducting rich explorations of migration, labor, gender, her Mexican-American identity, and the capacities of photography itself. She earned her BA from the University of California, Los Angeles in 1989, and her MFA at the California Institute of the Arts in 1996. She's also an associate professor at Cerritos College in Norwalk, California, where she has been on faculty since 2001. And I should say too that it is clear that she loves not only photography, but teaching and really truly loves her work. And I want to extend thanks for her generosity in meeting with some students earlier today. So Ms. Fernandez's projects have been featured in major exhibitions, including Home, So Different, So Appealing at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in 2017, Phantom Sightings, Art After the Chicano Movement, also at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, East of the River, Chicano Art Collector is Anonymous at Santa Monica Museum of Art, Flight Patterns at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, and Insight 97, which was in San Diego and Tijuana. Her work has also been exhibited at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, Smithsonian American Art Museum, Washington, D.C., Museum of Modern Art in New York, Bronx Museum of the Arts, El Paso Museum of Art, and many others. In 2021, Ms. Fernandez was one of the first artists honored with the prestigious Latinx Fellowship, an initiative of the U.S. Latinx Art Forum. The first major monographic museum exhibition of her work, titled Christina Fernandez, Multiple Exposures, opened in 2022 and is traveling nationally. Currently, the exhibition is on view at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art. Laura K. Munoz is an assistant professor of history and ethnic studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She teaches Latino studies and Mexican-American history, as well as other classes about American history, including migration, immigration, excuse me. Her research focuses on the histories of Latinx communities in the United States, especially in Nebraska, Arizona, and Texas. Her book, Desert Dreams, Mexican Arizona and the Politics of Educational Equality, is coming out this December, published by Penn Press at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Munoz has collaborated with community leaders in Nebraska to found Las Voces, a social justice collaborative that meets on Zoom every other Tuesday, and with the Scotts Bluff Barrio Boys Class of 1963, to raise money to build a Chicano Veterans Monument, among other endeavors. She hopes to write about these experiences in a future book about the history of Latinos in Nebraska. And with that, please join me in welcoming to the stage Cristina Fernandez and Laura Munda. I have to say, uh, so far, 
I thumbs up on Lincoln, Nebraska. The weather is beautiful today. <laughs> um, did you want to start with a question? You know, actually, I'm going to forward the slide. All right. There we go. So yes, I do. <laughs> I do want to start with a question. And I also want to start with by saying thank you to everyone for being here. And thank you to you for coming all this way to spend time with us. So my first question is a big one. You've been compared, your work, your vision, your eye, to some of the most iconic artists and photographers in American history. Um, Edward Hopper, Lewis Hine, and Dorothea Lange. How do you sit with that when you think about your work and its impact? Well, I definitely think that the work um, that I've done deals with issues of history, right? Uh, or the her story. Um, in one of my series, I deal with uh, my great grandmother's travel throughout the Southwest from Michoacan, Mexico. And I do so with photographic reenactment. And I try to emulate the um, you know, photographic style of the time. So the work is embedded both in uh, Mexican her story and in the history of photography. So I dip my you know, foot into the historical aspect of the medium from time to time. And so I do feel like I fit along the trajectory of photographers who um, photograph the working class, mm -hmm. um, photograph women, um, tell stories through photographs. Okay. I'm especially intrigued by the fact that you yourself grew up as a child of the Chicano movement and spent a lot of time working with farm workers, spending days, months, really essentially your childhood um, with the movement, and to see your work held in comparison to Dorothea Lange, who documented farm mm -hmm. work labor mm -hmm. in the early 1930s through the Great Depression and the 40s, um, I think is very interesting to see those two parallels, um, especially as you began to document the labor and the lives of, of Chicanas and Chicanos in, in the Southwest in this time period. I think that the image behind us also is part of that story, and I was wondering if you could tell us about this. Sure. Um, so this is the, uh, it's an install shot of my show as it appeared at the California Museum of Photography. Um, so the California Museum of Photography in Riverside um, had approached me about doing a survey of my work. It ended up being a 30-year survey along with a catalog um, that's like a piece, that, that's as heavy as a brick, the thing is so big. Um, because I hadn't had a monograph before, so it was kind of necessary to do a book like that. Um, so the survey uh, was initiated by the CMP and it's actually traveling, so it traveled to the Eamon Carter, which um, is like the twin sister architecturally to uh, the Sheldon. Um, and then it's at Smoka. It will continue to travel. Smoka, Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary. Um, then it will go to the Princeton Museum, San Jose Museum of Art, and then to DePaul. So what you're seeing is the original installation at the CMP. Um, so uh, the slide uh, shows the entrance. So we have this big wall, right, with my um, with several works on it from different series. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll get to the series as we climb through the slides. Uh, but the image that greets you is an image from a series that I did called Untitled Multiple Exposures, which takes the history, uh, the photographic history of Mexico and of Mexican photographers, and you know, I sort of appropriate it uh, by inserting my image into the image. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, so I'm gonna go on to the next slide. Um, so this is some older work that was in a display case at the museum. 
Um, we couldn't do a full retrospective. Uh, there was just too much work. Uh, so we decided to shorthand some of my earlier work pre-graduate school. So the show is basically graduate school on. And this is a series called um, Maria's Great Expedition. Um, it is the story um, of my great-grandmother on my mother's side. Uh, so it's my grandfather's mother. And she emigrated from uh, Michoacan, Mexico uh, in 1914 and lived throughout the Southwest uh, doing various jobs, having children, and eventually ended up in San Diego, um, California. All the work is reenactment, so it's me um, playing her in the, the imagery. Um, I meant for the work to look sort of like a natural history display, kind of museum display with the text. And the text is uh, the story of her life, but contextualized in a social political framework. So immigration issues of the time, um, womanhood issues, issues of the time. And then I created the images um, from the text. This is one of my favorite, uh, favorite, favorite, I guess, collections of yours because as a historian, I'm very much interested in the lives of Mexican American women and particularly from this time period of the early 20th century. And I know that this project um, also took this form because of um, the fact that you couldn't find images of your grandmother. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so when I started, um, well, initially the Mexican Museum in San Francisco had commissioned uh, a work and it, the curator, Chan Noriega, had approached me and said, you know, um, it's gonna be, the, the work needs to be in narrative form, it needs to be from a Chicano perspective, it should be about the Southwest. Um, and I'm like, well, that's perfect for my grandmother's story. So I started asking around um, my grandfather, my grandmother, uh, what pictures do we have of Maria? And it turned out we only had two pictures of her, and they were taken sort of late in her life. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I couldn't really tell the story of her life with these two photographs. There's some interesting things I probably could have done by appropriating those photographs and kind of doing something with them. But I really wanted to do this sort of chronological narrative of her mm -hmm, life. Mm -hmm. um, so my middle name is Maria. I was named after her. And I was also told that by my grandfather, every time he got a little too drunk, <laughs> he would tell yeah. me that I looked like his mother, and then he would give me some money. <laughs> and um, so I thought, well, I'll reenact her life, you know. But mm -hmm. with the budget the Mexican Museum gave me, which is like, I think, $1,500 at the time, there was just no way I was going to make a seamless, perfect reenactment. Mm -hmm. So within the image, you'll see there's anachronisms that are deliberately embedded because for me, that was the acknowledgement that this is a photograph taken now and this could be a woman mm -hmm. who is existing now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted it to kind of go from the personal to the sort of mm -hmm. transpersonal, just let it spread its wing wings a little bit. And mm -hmm have people be able to insert themselves into that narrative. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me because the symmetry between the present and the past is so present in these images. And it also speaks to um, the economic condition mm -hmm. that Latinas and Chicanas have found themselves um, in the United States really over the last century and how sometimes change over time doesn't actually take place. <laughs> and that <laughs> resonates in these images in particular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I also found amazing about your images is that they are so true to the historical moment. So I was touched in particular um, with uh, Maria as a laundress mm -hmm. in, in these um, images. And I think you have 
yeah, all I'll, of them I'll, in let here. Let me flip yeah. to, so that's the map. This is a composite map uh, that I made from Explorer's maps. Um, so I put these all together, I scanned them and made them one document and I traced in red her expedition, right? So that's mm -hmm, where the title mm -hmm. comes from, Maria's Great Expedition. So I'm sort of equivocating her with um, explorers of the time or mm -hmm. I, actually before her time. Um, I, I would actually oh, I have suggest that, that it's even um, reflective of this migration pattern that's that's consistently taken place over generations and over yeah. centuries mm -hmm. amongst um, people of Mexican heritage what we think of as people of Mexican heritage today but people who have traditionally been in these places yeah mm -hmm. I you know I don't have any experience with that but I can mm -hmm. imagine that being very true right yeah the same pathways mm -hmm. are taken so this is the first image in the series it's kind of out of order I apologize for that where she's leaving Michoacan. And so I have her kind of facing outwards, leaving the photograph, basically. And mm -hmm. she's looking into the edge of the photograph, sort of like an unknown space, right? And leaving this sort of blank space behind her. So I was very conscious of my body positioning, what mm -hmm. I wanted to say with the image. Um, and this is like done in a sort of sepia-toned manner, mm -hmm. trying to um, visually um, sort of call up the style of that time. Um, so this is 1914, leaving Morelia. And then the next image, which is out of order, is 1919, Portland, Colorado. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one of the, her first jobs was um, doing laundry for miners in Portland, um, Colorado. Uh, so here you can clearly see this anachronism that I'm talking about that I incorporated into the image so you know everything looks pretty authentic but then <laughs> you realize that nobody would have taken a portrait with you know a wash basin <laughs> right <laughs> portraits were expensive back then you know you couldn't just pick up your camera phone and take a photograph mm -hmm. and um, then you know she's got the fanny pack and the rubber gloves and so this is kind of the introduction to the idea of you know, using anachronism to talk about women now mm -hmm. and women then. And as you pointed out, not a lot had changed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so here she is in uh, Portland, Colorado, supposedly, right? <laughs> it's really the CalArt studio. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, leaving... Um, She's leaving back to go to Morelia to visit her family. And one of the things that I write in the text is that she wanted to let her family know that she was going back, yes, to visit mm -hmm. and say goodbye to her mother. Her mother was dying, um, but she wasn't going to stay, that she considered herself an American. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so she cut her hair in a bob. Mm -hmm. and wore red lipstick. This was the big statement, right? Yeah, About, definitely. I am not, you know, I'm, I cut my braids off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm a modern woman, I'm wearing makeup, and I'm even showing my ankles, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I um, reenacted re this. I didn't have the heart to cut my hair, so I put it in, in a tied it in a bun. <laughs> but I imagine she looks something like this. She earned money um, doing all kinds of crochet and embroidery arts. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how she earned a lot of her, that was like sort of her side gig besides being a laundress. Mm -hmm. um, so she would take, say, somebody's sheets and embroider initials or do some type of um, you know, stitching embroider, uh, stitching artwork on people's personal items. Mm -hmm. And she came, became very well known for that. So here I'm depicting her kind of doing that as she's waiting for the train. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going backwards. Oh my gosh, sorry. So it's funny, you mentioned Lang. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, so this is very much done in the style of Dorothea Lang. Mm -hmm. Um, the other photograph uh, was done in sort of a Hollywood film still style. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I don't know how many of you know Lang's work, but she was an FSA photographer. She became very well known for photographing migrant um, farm workers. And so this is Maria um, ba basically sharecropping. She earned enough money to buy a car and take produce to the markets and earn mm -hmm. money that way. Mm -hmm. And by this time, I think she has four children. Um, and this depicts her in Aliso Village, where my grandfather um, uh, brought his family to California. Uh, he was working in the shipyards mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, the World War II war effort. Um, and so she went to live with my grandfather and his family, including my mother. Um, and here she is doing more embroidery for one of the children. And she's doing that initial N. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, this is more like a 1950s sort of snapshot uh, photograph. And this is the last photograph. This is shortly, um, it's reenacting a period mm -hmm. shortly before she died in San Diego, California. She's got her 99 cent store uh, flyer, uh, again, working with that idea of anachronism bringing in contemporary life and I'm in actually the kitchen of Patsy Valdez I don't know, I know any mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you know the painter Patsy Valdez um, so uh, she let me borrow her kitchen because it had a classic sort of 1950s 40s style mm -hmm. stove yeah that I used as a prop is there a reason why you chose to photograph her alone in all of these images yeah, I mean, you know, uh, part of it was practical. <laughs> I like, couldn't imagine renting a bunch of children with somebody. <laughs> yeah, and and so this process of reenactment was really too about me connecting with my my family history, right? Is there anything you want to ask about the work before I move on? <laughs> no, no, that's okay. <laughs> So this is a, a quite a different series. This is called Man Manuela Stitched. It's mm -hmm. the photographs of uh, the front of uh, garment factories. Um, there's a text that goes along with these photographs. The text is um, embroidered with black thread onto muslin, which is a very common fabric that's used for garment draping and creating mm -hmm. patterns in the garment industry. Um, so these photographs are lined up next to each other to create sort of a street of garment factories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The photographs were taken all in the industrial parts of Los Angeles um, and the outskirts of Los Angeles like Montebello, Pico Rivera, all Latinx communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I saw these images, I just flashed back to that real women have curves. Oh yeah. And I uh -huh. thought, wow, <laughs> you know, this is what this is what that movie was about. Yes. These are all of those storefronts and then to understand the lives that are unfolding behind those doors. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a really different um, take, right, mm -hmm. on the similar subject matter. Mm -hmm. I'm um, standing outside photographing and the women are inside working. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they're not pictured. They're only pictured in this text, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, playing with these ideas of representation and um, how we depict working people, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I think, again, this goes back to Lewis Hines' work, um, looking at the, the laborer of the, of the 1910s and 20s and the conditions, mm -hmm. I mean, in, you, in this time period with the 80s and 90s, we, we sort of hide the workers mm -hmm, so that mm -hmm. nobody ever sees what's happening behind those doors. And then the workers themselves, their work, um, it, to me it seems, um, gets absorbed in a way that never um, gives credit back mm -hmm. to, to the artistry of those workers. Yeah, I mean, I think the work is largely hidden. Mm -hmm. So when I'm taking the photographs and not depicting the actual people that are working inside, it's from a standpoint of being a consumer, mm -hmm. right? 
um, because we really don't know who makes our clothes. We, right. Right. So even though all of us wear clothes, <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we really don't know what goes into making the clothes and who makes our clothes or our shoes for that matter, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, excuse me. So the text, I'll just read it. I, I know you guys can read, so, but <laughs> looking down, she saw that her stocking had a run. La Migra came like a storm today. The end of a black thread was caught on her heel. It trailed away, winding around the corner. She pictured an empty spool and feared they would notice it and find her. So obviously this is a fantastic narrative. This is a paranoid narrative. But I'm, what I'm trying to capture is the um, anxiety mm -hmm. and paranoia of the fear that people feel um, when they're being pursued by immigration. Um, for the text, I interviewed three garment workers mm -hmm. who had been in the industry at different times. And I would play the tapes over and over and over again in my car while I was driving. LA is a very, mm. you know, driving intensive city. And I would play the tapes over and over and over again. And I decided that I w didn't want to quote anybody because nothing was going to be, it would all be an excerpt of a much larger story. Mm -hmm. Um, so I created this narrative just from the feeling that I got from the words that were spoken mm -hmm. by these women who had worked in the industry. So this is like a bit of creative writing, basically. Um, I think the narrative layers the, the tensions that you heard in the interviews, and it also layers um, each of the storefronts. Mm -hmm. Because this could happen in any one of those storefronts. Yeah. And it's part of that hidden narrative that goes with the manufacturer of the clothing. Right. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I mean, when you look at the storefronts, if you ever get, get to see one of these up close, it's hard to determine from the slides. Uh, there's signage. There's mm -hmm. uh, patterns on the windows so that you can't see in. Uh, so there's all these layers actually on the building itself, right? Mm -hmm. So this is Fashion International. As you can see, they're looking for um, a worker, right? And there's both English, Spanish, and um, an Asian dialect, I don't know what, there on the sign. So this sort of represents the workers inside, right? They're looking for an overlock operator. The overlock is the stitch that does this thing, like on the edges of your clothing. T T and T fashions. <laughs> so these were shot with a four by five view camera. So um, they're you know they're not that big. They're like thirty by forty inches, but the detail is really amazing because of that larger format mm -hmm. um, camera I was using. And how far away are you from these actual doors? I'm like in the street, basically. Okay. Yeah, where a car would be parked, kind of like mm -hmm. a little bit further out, but yeah. So I tried to go when, you know, the traffic wasn't too bad, because mm -hmm. setting up a four by five view camera takes quite a lot, a while, and then you have to put your head underneath a black cloth to be able to focus the image. So it can be a little dangerous, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. so. You have bodyguards with you, <laughs> making sure you don't get As run sometimes over. Sometimes I had a friend who would come with me, sometimes yeah. not, you know. Mm -hmm. Here, they're looking for a cover stitch operator. So the cover stitch is that thing that you get on your jeans, um, that sort of overlapped stitch. And again, in English, and another Asian dialect mm -hmm. um, language. Here there's a bunch of signs. You know, I never noticed those signs yeah. in the window. In, in, the, in the enlargements, you can see them pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more detail. So, even though it's Los Angeles, I really did want to minimize the amount of cars mm -hmm. in the photographs, because usually these streets are just filled with cars. So 
I had to go and plan when you know the street sweeper was going to come by or when there was no parking allowed in order to get these shots. And I ph photographed them in June gloom because I wanted to get that real de detail that comes with an overcast sky. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Starline fashion. Okay, so here is the installation shot of the Lavanderia series. As Erin mentioned, um, the Sheldon acquired two of these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they acquired number one and number five, I believe. So we'll see those as I flip through the imagery. This Gosh. series really, this series resonated for me. I grew up in a... a working to middle class family and I spent a lot of my childhood in what we called washaterias in South Texas, laundromats. Um, washaterias. <laughs> and um, so I just like saw the image and flashed back to being a 12 year old girl, <laughs> my sister and I doing laundry and then have, remembering that feeling of shame of like people being able to see us through the windows. And so when I saw Washing your underwear. <laughs> yeah, and folding these sheets that had to be, my, my grandmother was actually a laundress. They owned a dry cleaner. Everything we did had to be impeccable in the ways that my family expected us to, to fold these sheets, you know. Yeah. Uh, you see all of the, on, on social media now, all of the guides on how you actually fold a, <laughs> a mattress sheet. Um, yeah, so I learned that very early on. So these, that's what came to mind when I looked at this. It's both the class, again, this, this is a, an important, I think, theme in your work, mm -hmm. is this moment of class that um, Latinos are experiencing across the century. Um, and then, of course, that idea that labor never ends. Yeah, you continue to labor as you go home, right? Mm -hmm. After long days of work, um, you need to still do the laundry. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, when you talk about um, th this idea of, you know, like these works as a sort of indication of class, is when you think about uh, people who don't have um, washers and dryers at home, these are mostly people who rent or have an apartment, or students. <laughs> um, because that's the last time I used a laundry rat is when I was a student. Um, and so, you know, I went about uh, looking for laundromats to photograph, starting in the Boyle Heights area, which is a really historically um, mixed um, neighborhood, but then eventually became uh, primarily Mexican-American Latinx neighborhood. Um, it's a section of uh, Los Angeles that is right across the LA River. Um, it's currently basically being gentrified. Um, so it's always been sort of this neighborhood in flux, but it's been a Latinx neighborhood since the, you know, the 1950s, mm -hmm, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I have, uh, or I did have a family home there. My, both my parents were raised in Boyle Heights. Mm -hmm. and my father still had a home there. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I was going to CalArts, I, I lived there, and I continued to live there mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. I finished. And I was photographing storefronts. I was really very much inspired by the nighttime scenes of mm -hmm. Edward Hopper. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to sort of emulate this idea of the lone figure, uh, the strange sort of nighttime light that you get in his interiors. Mm -hmm. I was very, very mm -hmm. much interested in depicting that in a different way. Um, so I went about with my 4 by 5 camera, um, hunting down laundromats. At, at the same time, there was this big trend of um, this sort of weird, drippy graffiti that had been etched into windows. Mm -hmm. So this is an etching liquid that is used as a tag okay. maker mm -hmm. instead of spray can um, mm -hmm. paint. So it's actually um, painted onto the window and then because it's like an acid, etching acid, it etches onto the window. 
So in order to replace, um, or in order to get rid of the graffiti, you have to replace the window. Wow. So these tags were up for a really long time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I became a little obsessed by these tags because they're both uh, oppressive and beautiful at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, oppressive because it obscures your view, right? For the person that's inside and for the person mm -hmm. that's outside. Mm -hmm. You can't see each other. You can't see a clear view of the street from inside. But somehow the painterly aspect of the tags and also the fact that they're translucent and the light kind of filters through them makes mm -hmm. them very beautiful and attractive, lovely to look at. So I kind of like this tension, aesthetically mm -hmm. speaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I did hunt down those um, those laundromats for a while and then uh, photographed a lot that didn't have these tags. I mm -hmm. wanted a little bit of variety in the mm -hmm. imagery. Um, I like the way that you look for life in each of these laundromats, whether it's plant life or human life. Um, that was so compelling to me in, in this particular image to see the cactus. Well, you know, I, have, I had to use these really long exposures, mm -hmm. like really long, like one, two seconds. That, 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 when somebody is moving, it's, it's going to be blurred. Um, there was no way that, there was no other way to do it, actually. I mean, I could have used a strobe, but then that would have flashed off the, the window yeah. pretty, mm -hmm. pretty badly. Um, I could have asked them all to stay very still while I photographed them. <laughs> I didn't think that was reasonable. So I came to terms with this idea of the blur mm -hmm. movement and the blur of labor. Right. Mm -hmm. um, did so. any of these people approach you or did you approach any of them? No, I would d generally sort of go in and, you know, say I'm a photographer. Don't be scared by this big camera that I'm mm -hmm. using. I was using a view camera and I would show them images that I had done before. There was only one place where the um, manager said, nope, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no, nope. and he chased me out. But everybody else was like, all right, you know. <laughs> Especially then when they realized they were going to be in blur. OK. Yeah, it wasn't such a big deal for them. And then I didn't, I never looked very, you know, I was always in a kind of in a rush to set up mm -hmm. camera, get something shot, do a correct exposure, get the person that I wanted in the scene. So I didn't really look very carefully sometimes. And, I never noticed the, the upside down flag while I was shooting. Oh, wow. But when mm -hmm. I printed it, I'm like, wow, there it is. Sign of protest, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is another one with the really uh, prevalent graffiti tags done with mm -hmm. that etching liquid. The other thing that was kind of interesting is when I was photographing, I thought I'd get only women. I mean, that's so yeah. dumb of me to think that way. But no, there was a lot of men mm -hmm. doing their own laundry by mm -hmm. themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And I can imagine these are men, immigrant men, that maybe didn't have girlfriends or women, mm -hmm. or maybe they were just that independent um, that they did their own laundry. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of, there's a lot of men in the photographs. Mm -hmm. That's really something I had not anticipated. I think that's also a reflection of the way our generation was socialized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and how gender expectations have shifted quite a bit mm -hmm. um, within, the, within the Latino community. I think migrants are at the forefront of those shifts. If we think about, Maria coming by herself, a soltera to the U.S. If we think about these men in the present coming by themselves, and they have been really yeah. since the 1950s, yeah. um, that you're giving us a glimpse into that migrant cycle of mm -hmm. men coming here to labor, taking care of themselves, sending the money, yeah, and then home. waiting yeah. until they yeah. are of retirement age to return. Or waiting until they can bring their families over, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
this is the other one the Sheldon acquired. So what's interesting about this image is I had never printed it. Wow. It had never been exhibited. And I often, I, you know, it was one of the ones that I was like, mm, on the fence about. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. But I think people respond to the relationship of the two young men. Yeah. And how their, their heads are tilting towards each other. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're close. They're, they're, you know. Yeah, they're very close. Yeah. Their legs are touching. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. It's obvious there's some type of construction worker. They have the mm -hmm. heavy boots on, um, and they're just waiting for their laundry. I think it's also typical of, of the kind of scenes that you see on a college campus. Like, we spend a lot of time looking at each, looking at each other's backs in rooms <laughs> like this, <laughs> or walking across campus where you see youth sitting on benches, yeah. or at the library talking to their friends. Or doing their laundry. Yeah. <laughs> This is actually one of my favorites. I was just going to ask you if you had a favorite. Yeah, yeah. this is yeah, mm -hmm. this is one of my favorites. I just like all the directional lines. I like it for purely formal, mm -hmm. you know, photographic reasons. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, the uh, foil wallpaper on the back is pretty awesome. <laughs> And this is the last one of the series. Mm -hmm. I think you capture the aesthetics, too, of these laundromats. They're, they're, there's always a color scheme in all of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of them are pretty horrible. <laughs> but it's, it makes it more interesting. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, it makes it more interesting to photograph, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so another install shot of a series called Untitled Multiple Exposures. Mm -hmm. So this work came out of um, travels that I had had to Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, I was interested in photographing the Zapotec ruins there. Um, Ana Mendieta, hopefully you guys know her work. If you don't, mm -hmm. look her up. Um, I, I do she, have to say, Shout out to the Midwest. She's from, yeah. she's from the oh, yes. PS. She spent quite a bit of time. She did she in did. the Midwest. So she grew up here as a Cuban refugee. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Of that. Yeah. I had forgotten. But um, so she did work in um, one of the Zapotec ruins, and I'm like, you know, I wonder what I could do. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very interested at the time in performance for camera work, um, which is kind of what she was doing she she was more of a documenter of her performances mm -hmm. a little bit different just a hair hair splitting a little bit here but very interesting artist somebody that i was kind of but really one of the, interested in it at the time one of the inspirational sort of path-breaking latina artists of the yeah. mid-20th century mm -hmm. totally yeah um, so I traveled to Oaxaca to photograph the ruins. I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do there. Um, so I photographed the ruins and I went down three times, I believe. But as a side experience, as a, a different kind of experience, um, I uh, was really taken aback by the racism that I witnessed. Mm -hmm. towards indigenous peoples in Oaxaca. It was really hard for me to digest, hard for me to process, because I had been raised in a Chicano activist family where we revered indigenous people and culture. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I just, that was really difficult for me. So when I came home, I was like, how do I, how do I make a work that somehow talks about this, right? Mm -hmm. This gap that I feel between me and them, yet I was raised in this activist family that reveres indigenous cultures, but mm -hmm. we are really different. So I was grappling with, mm -hmm. grappling mm -hmm. with how to represent that. Uh, so I decided to um, use the technique of multiple exposures. So if you've never, 
done analog photography, you wouldn't have this experience at all. So analog photography with film, you shoot the roll of film, you rewind, right? And then with multiple exposure, you reload the film mm -hmm. and shoot over it. So you end up with two images on one frame. Uh, well, you could do that three times too and mm -hmm. you'd get an even more layered image. Now with digital photography, it's really different because you could just put things in Photoshop and layer them infinitely mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, reduce opacity and then you have a layered image. So um, this was done in camera. So I would photograph uh, the images of indigenous women by famous Mexican photographers in books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm photographing these books. I'm kind of using a magnifying filter on my uh, camera lens to really um, magnify the image. Mm -hmm. I'm making them portrait. I'm turning the image vertical. Um, when some of these images are actually horizontal images, so I'm really zeroing in on the um, on the image, and then um, I'm taking notes, right, about what the image is, what frame is related to what image, um, and then I go to, into the studio and photograph myself uh, on the roll of film, somewhat interacting mm -hmm. with the image of the indigenous woman, right? So I'm either emulating their pose or embracing them in some way. Um, and I'll just go through the images so you can see. What struck me about these images is how you invert the male gaze, because here we have these iconic, um, mostly male, I think you, I think there's yeah. only one female artist, one female photographer yeah, Midori, artist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how you, their, their preconceived notions of who indigenous women are within Mexican society. And then here you are, a Latina from the United States, critiquing in some sense um, their gaze on a binational level, but also on a gendered level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't get that then, but, but you're right. <laughs> So more of the installation. These are my contact sheets, notes, books that I used. Oops, did I skip one? Yeah, okay. So on this one, you could really see the halftone pattern. It was important for me to acknowledge that these images were from books and not women that I knew, that I know these women through their photographic image and reproduction in photographic books. So the original image that's appropriated here is from um, uh, Gabriel Figueroa, who was a cinematographer during the heyday of Mexican film in the 40s. And these, Im these women are nameless also in, yes. their, in their images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Manuel Alvarez Bravo, um, photograph a young woman looking at birds. The photograph is called Girl Watching Birds. So I'm laying my image over or under, depending on how you look at it, uh, and emulating her hand gesture here. The original photograph that I uh, appropriated here is done by Nacho Lopez, who's a photojournalist from Mexico City. Another Bravo image. So one of the things that I was conscious of when I was lighting these photographs is I was wanting to fill in the shadow. So if there was a significant shadow in the imagery, I would try to fill it in by lighting my body on the opposite end, mm -hmm. right? So that's, this is a perfect example of that, what I was doing. This particular image to me is reminiscent of the work of Yolanda Lopez. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. In her self-portrait series, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Again, you could really see that halftone pattern in these. Uh, 
some of them get a little weird. <laughs> I kind of like it. <laughs> and this is the only Madodi image. So Tina Madodi was an expat, Italian expat, who lived in Mexico. Um, if you watch the movie Frida, she's played by Ashley Judd, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. I ho held off on using Madodi's images because she photographed women so sculpturally and mm -hmm. individually. It was hard to figure out how I was going to use that. So, yeah. Almost all of these Mexican artists um, also took images of Frida Kahlo, and I thought it was interesting that you skipped over those. Is there yeah. a reason? No, she's too recognizable, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as far as I know, she wasn't really indigenous. She dressed no, like an indigenous yeah. mm -hmm. women, woman, but she wasn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She was German, Jewish, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. All right, so a different exhibition this was done at the Benton Museum of Art at the Claremont Colleges. Um, I worked with their uh, collection, just sort of mining their collection for images of labor, images of uh, farm workers, um, and displayed aspects of their collection along with two installations that I did. So um, this is install view, more install. So this is another group of work that um, came out of my travels to Oaxaca. So here you can actually see the Zapotec ruins that I photographed. Mm -hmm. um, one is a large mural, the others are smaller 20 by 30 photographs that are mounted onto the mural. And then I have text on either side. Uh, the text is kind of a, what I would call a travel narrative mm -hmm. about some of my expectations um, that I had traveling to Oaxaca, Mexico, and then some of the, the experiences that I mm -hmm. had that didn't quite fit my expectations. And at the same time, um, when on one of my visits to Oaxaca, my grandmother was passing. She was mm -hmm. dying. Mm -hmm. And um, so the narrative addresses this idea of me going back to Oaxaca, to Oaxaca to like sort of find myself or whatever. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. my grandmother, who I was very close to, is dying. And like, what am I doing here when I should be there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this idea of going back to the idea of homeland mm -hmm. and going back to homeland to sort of try to come to some type of identity for oneself is an incredibly problematic project. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, uh, the narrative talks about that. I think all of those themes are so in tune with Ana Mendieta's work. And this piece mm -hmm. is the most closely related to that discussion? Yes, definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the middle image is a performance for camera piece. So I painted a kind of rudimentary skeleton on my back as mm -hmm. a sort of um, a reference to my grandmother passing, but mm -hmm. also a reference to a skeleton that was on display in the museum of mm -hmm. an older woman that they found in one of the tombs. Mm. and um, also the idea of the burden that I was carrying, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and trying to, to get rid of that burden. And I will not read all this text, but that's what <laughs> the text looked like. Um, and then the images of mm -hmm. the Zapotec ruins. I think the landscape's very telling, too, because it's, it's also connected very much to the Sierra, Sierra Madre, and you see these same landscapes when you, when you travel up through the borderlands, whether you're in Arizona or California, that, that those silhouettes are, are prominent. The text talks a lot about those Zapotec belief system, which mm -hmm. is all sky gods. And when you look at the um, images of the ruins, you can see that the skies are always these very traumatic, cloud, mm -hmm. cloudy, you know, beautiful skies. And you can see, you understand 
why their belief system was what it was. Mm -hmm. um, and in the other installation room, I did a project that I called Untitled Farm Workers. It's about um, farm worker uh, deaths due to pesticide and global warming, so heat stroke. So there's a canvas piece on the back wall that deals with pesticide um, deaths and then the cards in um, the rectangle, dirt rectangle, are um, deaths from um, heat stroke due to global warming. So in California and all along mm -hmm. um, the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, um, we're having problems with temperatures, especially like in our Central Valley, going up to 105, 110 degrees. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And farm workers who work the fields range in age from like 17 to like 65. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, you know, and these are especially vulnerable populations to this kind of heat. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, so th it's, become, it's becoming a real mm -hmm. problem. Um, and so I thought that I needed to acknowledge that in some way. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all eat the fruit and vegetables that they uh, harvest, and um, there's literally blood <laughs> on on them. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm a big farm worker advocate because of my parents' advocacy for them, but also um, not a lot has changed. Mm -mm. I mean, this problem persists. It's continual. So um. this is a growing um, issue in Nebraska, too. Um, for the first, I want to say for the first time we, in the last two years, I believe, we've had um, workers die um, during the corn harvest season. And that's not typical. But the levels of heat in the summer here have, have changed immensely. So I think that there's some resonance. Wow, mm -hmm. yeah. And I can imagine in, in the cornfields, things get really humid, too. That's mm -hmm. uh, not very comfortable. So I decided to um, represent the, the workers uh, with a, a card rather than mm -hmm. the, an image of their face, where sometimes that's not available anyways. Um, and sort of planting the card as a seed, but also it's reminiscent of a tombstone as well, mm -hmm. or just record keeping in general, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's my brother's hand of planting the card. And I used different exposures so that my brother's hand would appear darker and brighter. Oh, wow, that's cool. Um, <laughs> I wondered about that. Yeah. I was like, how many different people did she have do yeah. this? That's yeah. amazing. Because we come in all colors, right? <laughs> shades. <laughs> Some uh, close-ups of the installation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have Jose Macarena Hernandez, who died at 64 years of age in Santa Maria, mm -hmm. harvesting squash. Uh, I, Frankie Gonzalez, who... Um, it says developed leukemia. Yeah. Pesticides were found in the drinking my, water. I, I can't crane. Yeah. I can't crane my <laughs> neck that far. So Dolores Huerta is the uh, female counterpart to Cesar Chavez. Mm -hmm. And she was actually beaten by police at a point in her, um, when she was active on boycott picket lines. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dolores Huerta came to Nebraska, oh. <laughs> uh, I want to say last year, maybe the year before, uh, to meet with students here at yes. our student union. She's mm -hmm. so beautiful. She's such a beautiful person. All right. Um, so another series that I'm working on right now is called um, Suburban Nightscapes, and it's completely different from what I've done before. So I am um, the very proud mother of a young man who's turning 18 mm -hmm. this month. Um, I'm a single mom. He's an only child. We're super close, super, super close, but not so much anymore. He's mm -hmm. um, 
becoming a man and has a girlfriend and you know has friends and doing things and has his driver's license. Um, and so I'm just creating a set of work that is just a kind of about his life and me sort of um, celebrating who he's become as a person, mm -hmm. as a young man. Um, so I displayed three of these in an installation at the CMP. Um, I'm, so, I I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was ahead. just gonna say, I'm so glad that you actually included this image um, in Lincoln, and I would assume in the Midwest, but regionally, and it's my experience in Lincoln, on nights like this, if you walk through the neighborhoods, you can smell um, all of the backyard um, fire pits that um, are being lit. Yeah. And for me as a Mexicana or Mexican-American woman, it's interesting to hear people talk about Chimenea culture yeah. uh, in the Midwest. Um, so when I saw this image, I immediately thought of, of, of that, sm I could smell that firewood. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in Southern California, it doesn't get that cold, but we like a fire for ambiance. <laughs> and we do a lot of things in our front yards. And I realize in other places they don't, but we mm -hmm. do a lot of stuff in our front yards because usually the dogs have taken over the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Limited space back there. So my son is a fireworks enthusiast. We like go in to Nevada to get fireworks. So who are these uh, young people out here with him? They're just all his friends, you know. Okay. This was sort of my, um, what's the word, like my acknowledgement of how important Stranger Things was visually. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, I call this my Stranger Things photograph. Like they're all walking into this, you know, portal of some sort, <laughs> this fireworks portal of some sort. Sometimes, you know, experiencing feeling a little lonely or isolated. Mm -hmm. So my kid is a car person. He loves cars, and this is his 1969 uh, El Camino. Wow. <laughs> yeah, the racing stripe. This is kind of my ode to the film Dazed and Confused. <laughs> Have you guys ever seen Dazed and Confused? Oh, you have to see it when you when you get home today. Yeah, Matthew McConaughey. They're in a Chevelle with the same racing stripe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually went to college with Matthew McConaughey <laughs> at the University of Texas at Austin. <laughs> so this is a very, although this is a stage scene, this is a very common scene in our front yard where the guys are looking over whatever happens mm -hmm. to be wrong with the '69. El Camino at the time, because mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a lot of things that go wrong with it sometimes, yeah. So they get together and they fix it, they help him fix it. I know you said these are a part of this sort of homage to your relationship with your son, but for, for me, when I see them, I, I see like contemporary, like 21st century youth culture, mm -hmm. young male culture. The, the images for me seem like they could be almost anywhere in America. Mm -hmm. And you could find a group of boys doing this. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's working on a shed project, installing insulation. Our dog wants in. <laughs> so he his has friends a, he has are a, always helping him. Yeah. This is his backyard shed. Yeah, okay. yeah. this is man cave. And what so kind of camera are you using for these images? Oh, these are all, these are digital images done with a Sony okay. um, AR74. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was a group project that they put together. They go around on their bikes, on their motorcycles, picking up um, trash that's been put out the day before trash day or the night before trash day, and they pick up whatever strikes their fancy and they actually made this scooter <laughs> uh, from the junk that they collected so very creative mm -hmm. i love the uh, dining chair as the mm -hmm. you know 
passengers <laughs> seat. And they actually take this out riding. I mean, I can't imagine what people think of mm -hmm. it <laughs> when he they see that passing by. <laughs> So there it is on the left-hand side, one of his friends is riding it in the riverbed. We have a riverbed near our, our house mm -hmm. where they go and ride, because it's the only place to ride. In Los Angeles, you cannot ride a dirt bike on the street. Mm -hmm. You can basically ride a dirt bike nowhere, mm -hmm. basically. In order to ride his dirt bike, or any type of scooter, or electric, or um, I don't know what they're called, the little gas powered mini bikes mm -hmm. uh, you have to drive an hour and a half and so what they do is they because we live near the riverbed he, they just go down to the riverbed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they have at it and they have a lot of fun and sometimes he'll come home at two in the morning I'm like let me guess you were at the riverbed all night yeah <laughs> so but what's increasingly become a problem which is not pictured here is uh, we've got a really bad um, unhoused situation mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. LA County and so a lot of these people have set up underneath the bridges mm -hmm. where the overpasses are and some of them are, are not very nice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so he's had situations where they take the shopping carts and completely block it off and it's likely because these bikes are really noisy yeah. and they're disturbing so they have to go over the overpass and, um, you know, they've gotten yelled at many times. Mm -hmm. Some dogs have chased them. Um, but they're learning how to survive. You know, that's, that's the one thing. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. one thing to learn how to survive in some Xbox game. It's another to go out there in the world and, and learn how to yeah. negotiate space mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, have a little fun at the same time. Because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they love riding their bikes. So this is an ongoing project. I am going to be exhibiting this uh, at my gallery in November. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just the beginning, I think. Uh, because, you know, it, it's got to flip back to me, too. Like, I'm yeah. celebrating his growing up and becoming a man and celebrating the person that he is. But I also need to flip back to mm -hmm. who I've become as a result of being his mother for 18 years. Yeah, And... Um, where do I fit in the world now that he's kind of leaving the fold a little bit, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So I've always done, as you can see, you know, sort of performance for camera work. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking I'll probably return to that type of work for mm -hmm. a short bit of time. Um, I think you've always done too work that's reflective of these histories of families. Yeah. And this is another part of that. That yeah, story. Very mm -hmm. much so. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much so. It's very different work. It's the most commercial work I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, obviously. You know. Some elements of it are <laughs> some elements of it are very Californian though. Yeah, we, exactly. This riverbed <laughs> phenomenon yeah. is, is very concrete LA. rivers. Do you guys yeah. have concrete rivers out here? <laughs> Um, I, 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 I don't know. Do they? <laughs> I don't think so. No, I think that... Yeah. Our rivers mm -hmm. are basically concrete. It's to mitigate the water so things don't get flooded and all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways. You still, you still want to entertain some more questions? Because I'm sure the audience does have sure. questions yes. to ask you. <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Love your work. Oh, thank you. It's incredible. Um, I, I, I guess a question, there's, um, there's kind of a dryness to, to many of your series, but there's also an intimacy, and you're able to be kind of dry and distant and intimate this, at the same moment. And I, I also noticed that planes, uh, as, as in... Um, seem to be a part of much of whether it's a window or a wall or a door or a pane of glass or something so could you speak to a bit of those things yeah aspects? i mean i i have another series that i did not include uh called view from here where i'm photographing out of the windows of uh mostly artists who have passed uh onto the landscape uh, and the landscape is rendered out of focus through depth of field. So there's even another one that deals with windows. 
Um, but I, I've always wanted to kind of break space a little bit because photographs can be so, they are flat. Photographs are flat, but they can also look flat. So I'm trying to break space a little bit by penetrating through depth of field effect or by layering imagery like I did with uh, the laundromat photos and also untitled multiple exposure. So just trying to break up that 2D space a little bit. The Manuela stitched stuff, you're right, is very dry, very banal, very fully frontal, very flattening. But the text is very, in a way, very fantastic, right? It's very um, nightmarish, right? And so I try to counter counterbalance that flatness with that more emotional speech, right? Um, that actually conjures another image in your mind created by you, right? So I'm playing with those ideas, especially with a lot of the text that I use. Great question, thank you. So I notice in your work, in your, for the first work that you showed, or an interpretation of mine, that there's almost like a resistance to assimilate, to look at your roots, to project your identity to a, to a, a Mex to Mexican culture, and the photos of your child are kind of more of a witness of a new identity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think that's a, a, a phenomenon that happens, I think, uh, with um, people of Mexican ancestry, right? So I'm fourth generation. Um, so that means my family has been here for a really long time. And so, um, Obviously, my great-grandmother, who was the first to cross, uh, was very Mexican, but even in that moment, asserted her American identity by cutting her hair and wearing red lipstick and going back home and saying, mm, no, I like it over there better. I think for her, a lot of the reason was um, the, you know, the gender roles that she just didn't want to live by anymore. She had gotten a taste of not, of being independent. Not that that wasn't happening here in the US, um, but also she wanted to leave Catholicism. We haven't been Catholic for these four generations. I was raised Episcopalian. Um, so the, that was something that she felt strongly about. And that's very different from most Mex Mexican and Mexican-American households. Most of them are, are Catholic. Um, then the political activism comes, right, uh, where uh, my grandfather, who was one of the founders of LULAC in the Southwest, and he worked on the Mendez versus Board of Education uh, of Santa Ana um, uh, case, that helped desegregate Santa Ana schools. So, and then my parents were activists. Um, so there's all these layers of fighting for Mexican and Mexican American rights, but at the same time, with each progressive generation getting more and more assimilated. And of course, that's what was advocated for during those times. Now, because of the Chicano movement, we have bilingual education. We have people that don't feel the need to have to unlearn Spanish in order to exist in America, right? But back then, you were very much encouraged, if not told, to lose the Spanish and speak English. Um, so, and we were talking about this earlier, the constant immigration from Mexico were constantly being juxtaposed, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Where you get the newer immigrants who speak Spanish and keep their Spanish and wonder why mm -hmm. these fourth generation people don't speak 
speak Spanish and sometimes they're a little critical of mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's all those subtleties going on and you know the work about my son well he has Mexican friends he has white friends he has black friends he has Asian he has, they have paid no attention to any of it they're very you know uh, they're very diverse um, they don't tolerate uh, racism within their friends mm -hmm, friends mm -hmm. group they they um, if there is a friend that that um, is racist or says something racist, they're like, hey, wait, you know, stop. So they're very, you know, aware of all these different um, cultures. Uh, like his girlfriend is uh, first generation and her dad is like, uh, you know, a former gang member who's all tatted up to his neck, you know, so completely different from my family, completely. And so they, they associate with each other they um, commune with each other. They do things together, and I think it's I think it's really one of the unique things of, about living in in Southern California right now is that you've got all these different nuances happening culturally. And people, uh, these young people, they they um, they kind of embrace it and live with it. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Okay. <laughs> I think that your work, you, you talked a lot about 2D versus 3D, and we have these 2D stereotypes of who Mexicans are, and your work really attempts to bring that, to push, that, push those boundaries, yeah. push those walls, and show us intergenerational shifts, um, cultural, cultural exchange, cultural difference, the ways that we conceptualize culture in place and in time, yeah. the multiplicity of what it means to be Mexicana or Chicana or Mexican-American. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're spot on about that. Yeah. Any other questions? I see. Oh, one more? OK. One last question. Aaron's like, um. I'm just curious about um, the clothing in Maria's Great Expedition. I'm just curious if these were clothes that you already had or if you purchased them. Oh, especially... a bunch of stuff happened. <laughs> okay. I'm especially curious about the first outfit with the long sleeve dress and the shawl. Yeah. Just a lot of it was thrifted and a lot of it I sewed myself. Yeah. So I had been a fashion design major. Yeah. So I knew how to sew and make a pattern. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so a lot of it I created myself, and a, a heck of a lot of it was thrifted. We have like great thrift stores in LA, so just hunting and hunting and hunting for the right outfit. And I would look at photographs from the time and try to, you know, give it that kind of, um, for lack of a better word, that kind of vibe. You know, I wanted to wanted it to ring a, 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 at least a little bit authentic, even though the budget was, you know, kind of restraining, but yeah. Thank you for the question. I love when people ask about the clothing in that series, because I get to say, I thrifted. it. <laughs> well, I think that is a perfect place to end. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you, Laura. What a really wonderful conversation. Thank you all again for coming. Um, hopefully this has been inspiring for you and we invite you to come back and take a closer look again at Christina Fernandez's Lavanderia um, number one that is in our Works on Paper exhibition until late December. Yay. So thank you, <laughs> have a wonderful, safe evening. Thanks, guys. <laughs>